Thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to, uh, to be invited to this workshop and I'm going to uh, now share my screen. Do you see it? I can't see it yet. Okay. Do you see go. it now? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, great. So that was a, a super introduction by uh, by Matteo. So that's going to spare me the, uh, <laughs> the need to do any kind of literature review, uh, which is wonderful. I just want to uh, to point out a big picture idea here. We see, which is that in uh, in finance, uh, there's I think an increased interest and uh, an increased effort to to build models which are able to talk jointly about quantities and and prices. And in the case of international finance, that translates into models which are able to model jointly gross capital flows and uh, and exchange rate in particular, but also uh, asset prices. So uh, there's a a distinguished earlier literature that um, that was mentioned by uh, by Matteo uh, trying to deal with these issues. There's a recent uh, revival uh, of that literature, and this paper is very much uh, into that uh, recent wave. Uh, if I have to pinpoint uh, one paper in the in the current literature which is the closest to what we are doing, I think it's uh, the paper by Ralph and uh, and Moto Yogo, because we share. Uh, the, the view uh, of trying to uh, model jointly portfolio choice in different types of assets, which are imperfect substitutes. In our case, it's going to be equities uh, at home and foreign equities and also riskless bonds together with exchange rates and to try to model jointly the uh, uh, so investment flows and, uh, and exchange rates. So that's, uh, that's the menu for, for today. Um, so um, in, in, this, uh, in this work, which is uh, joint with uh, Harald Howe and uh, Nelson Camano, uh, what we are uh, trying to, uh, to present here is not a general equilibrium model. So in that sense, that's different from the work of uh, uh, Xavier and, uh, and Matteo, that uh, Matteo alluded to before. But on the other hand, what we are uh, trying to do is to endogenize uh, an optimal portfolio here. Uh, together with, um, with uh, movements in the exchange rate in an incomplete uh, market uh, setup. So we are going to be able to do a joint determination of exchange rate, portfolio flows, and, and equity returns. Uh, while in the work of Xavier and, and Matteo, which is general equilibrium, uh, uh, but on the other hand, the, uh, the portfolio problem uh, is, is um, is not uh, is not endogenized there. So that's the, the difference between the two approaches. So we are going to take a number of simplifying assumptions, uh, as you will see. But what we are going to get out of our model is that we are going to have some prediction regarding home bias. We are going to have home bias due to exchange rate risk. More importantly, we are going to have um, rebalancing. Uh, between domestic and foreign shares of the portfolios, uh, which and this rebalancing will be due to uh, valuation changes on the domestic and foreign share of the portfolios. This rebalancing will be uh, increasing with uh, exchange rate risk, uh, foreign exchange volatility. And uh, what is going to be, I guess, um, interesting about the model is that this uh, aggregate rebalancing flows will in turn affect uh, exchange rate dynamics. Okay, so that's, there's going to be really a complex issue here between the exchange rate dynamics and the equity returns and the portfolio flows. Now, once we specify uh, the model, we will also test it in the, in the data. And in order to do that, we are going to use a large international equity holding data set uh, in which we can explore not only the main mechanism, but we can also say things about heterogeneity uh, across, uh, across equity funds. So what will we find? We'll find in the data strong evidence for portfolio rebalancing as uh, predicted by, by the theory. Uh, this uh, portfolio rebalancing is amplified indeed by exchange rate risk. We'll also explore um, heterogeneity across funds and we will find uh, some evidence of uh, uh, heterogeneity which is quite, uh, quite strong. Uh, smaller funds will be associated to stronger portfolio rebalancing and funds with less diversified portfolios will be associated to stronger rebalancing as well. And finally, uh, using a granular IV estimation technique developed by uh, uh, Xavier and Ralph, uh, we will be able to, to, to test for the causality of uh, the effect of portfolio rebalancing flows on the exchange rate. So that will be the last part of the presentation. 
Okay, so what, is, what does the model look like? Uh, it's uh, a priori quite simple. Uh, we are going to assume that there is uh, two equity markets, which are going to be two exogenous dividend flows, one at home, uh, one in the foreign uh, economy. There's going to be also some local risk-less bond in full, uh, full, fully elastic uh, supply. So the, the real interest rate will be exogenously determined and, 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 and fixed. And we will assume R equal R star to make uh, uh, the setup uh, symmetric and, and, and easier to deal with. Um, an important assumption is that the uh, foreign exchange uh, risk taken by the uh, uh, equity investors is not going to be hedged. So there is incomplete FX risk trading in this model, and that's really important. So there is exchange rate risk, and it will play a key role. In equilibrium, the exchange rate will be determined by the uh, demand from the flow dynamics coming from the portfolio rebalancing of the equity investors and the supply of the, uh, of the risk averse uh, foreign exchange uh, liquidity trader. Okay, so that's going to be supply equals demand, uh, and that will determine the exchange rate in equilibrium. So it will all be, I think, clearer once I show you the equations. Here are the investors. So these are the um, home and the foreign investors. Their equity uh, weights are going to be determined, uh, so are going to be denoted by H for home and F for foreign. Uh, the home investor doesn't have a star. The foreign investor has a star, so that's easy to track. Uh, they are both mean variance investors. They solve the following optimization uh, problem here. What is important is that their value, their profit in their domestic currency. Okay? So they value their profit in their home currency. This mean variance uh, optimization problem will uh, lead to linear asset demand functions. And uh, when they uh, do their optimal portfolio problem, they do not take into account their price impact on asset prices or on the exchange rate. Now, here are the two exogenous dividend process for the two stock markets. They are Austin Ulenbeck processes at home and, and abroad. And if we were in, in autarky, uh, we would have um, the fundamental value of the equity, which would be simply the expected present value of future discounted dividends. And we would have this very simple formula here, given the fundamental value, the FTH and the FTF. However, in the model, of course, it's not going to be uh, the, the value of the equity simply because we are going to have a joint determination of the uh, equity value together with the uh, exchange rate uh, due to the uh, incomplete market uh, assumption that we have. So we have um, set up the exogenous stochastic process, the demands of the, uh, uh, the type of demand of the, uh, of the equity traders. So now uh, we just need to write down the market clearing condition. There we assume uh, that elasticities are in uh, uh, supply normalized to one in each of the two countries. So we normalize the equity supply to, to one. And that's the market clearing condition for, for equity. What about foreign exchange markets? So that's uh, uh, the kind of uh, important thing here. So the currency demand is uh, linked to the uh, portfolio rebalancing of the two uh, equity investors. So we have some currency demand which comes from dividend repatriation of the two currency of the two equity traders. This would be the two first term here in this DQT equation. They are linked to the uh, dividend repatriation. More importantly, the two last terms are linked to the portfolio uh, behavior, the portfolio rebalancing behavior of the uh, two uh, equity investors. So uh, they correspond to the change in weight um, due to their optimal asset demand. And ET is here the exchange rate. It's denominated in foreign currency per domestic currency, per domestic. So it's, uh, if ET goes up, it uh, corresponds to a foreign depreciation. Right, so now we have all the uh, ingredients except the currency supply. So this currency demand coming from the equity investment is met by uh, a risk averse global arbitrager. We will have a price elastic uh, excess supply curve. And uh, there's an important parameter here, which we will estimate in the data, uh, which is Kappa. So it's going to give us how elastic or inelastic the currency supply is. So we can think 
as this currency supply arbitrager as uh, selling a currency if it's high compared to its fundamental value, which could be thought as, so it's E bar here, it could be thought as a long run PPP value, for example. Uh, or uh, we could augment uh, this uh, currency supply with a differential in interest rate if R was different from R star, but here we assume it's equal. Or we could uh, conceivably uh, also interpret this uh, currency supply as coming from the real side of the economy and coming from some kind of current account uh, relationship where, again, if E is above its long run value, we have a current uh, account uh, uh, deficit or a current account surplus in the other case. So there are multiple ways of interpreting this currency supply. Uh, I will just uh, take it as a reduced form and kappa is this important parameter, which is the elasticity of this uh, supply curve. Now the foreign exchange equilibrium is just currency demand equals currency supply. So this is uh, what this equation is telling us here. I just uh, redefined net dividend income as these two terms here in a more compact way. And here this is the portfolio rebalancing behavior. We have all the ingredients, the market current conditions, uh, the equity investments, and then the foreign exchange equilibrium. So, uh, we can now uh, actually solve the model. And in order to solve this model, because of the exchange rates uh, interacting with all the terms here, we are linearizing it around the, uh, uh, the steady state. So we are uh, in this class of linearized models. What we can show is that there is a unique equilibrium. And this unique equilibrium uh, will be interesting if we restrict somewhat the parameter values. Uh, this unique equilibrium will feature international diversification, provided that uh, the traders are sufficiently risk-taking and that the elasticity of foreign exchange supply is sufficiently large. In other words, if we had very risk-averse traders and an elasticity of forex supply, which would be very low, we would have so much volatility and risk that each of the investors would just invest at home and would not diversify their portfolio. So that would not be very interesting equilibria. So we are gonna focus on equilibria in which uh, there is international diversification. And uh, for those types of equilibria, so we're gonna solve for the two asset prices, the, the equity prices, the exchange rate, and also the uh, equity holdings of both the domestic and the foreign investor. All right, uh, so uh, what does this equilibrium look like? Uh, when there is international investment. This equilibrium uh, has the following feature. The price of a domestic equity uh, is a function has feature a risk premium. It features the fundamental value of the equity, which depends on the dividend flows. And it also depends on two extra stochastic terms here, which we also find in the price of a foreign equity in a symmetric way, since everything is completely symmetric in this model, and which also feature in the exchange rate uh, which is centered around one and also has these two uh, stochastic components. So as we see, there are common uh, stochastic components here, uh, pricing both the uh, price, the two equity prices and the exchange rate. And uh, the uh, dynamic portfolio holdings look like that. So what we observe is that uh, there is home bias. This H bar here is uh, smaller than, than 0.5. That means that one invests more in in uh, one's own asset than abroad. Why? Because here we want to diversify. On the other hand, uh, when we take some, um, uh, when we invest in foreign equity, we are facing an extra risk here, which is the foreign exchange risk, which is not hedged. And therefore this wedge between the foreign equity return and the domestic uh, equity return makes me, uh, since I value return in my own currency, makes me uh, have a home bias portfolio. So I have a home bias in my, in my own equity, which is what we see here uh, with those weights. And then I am fluctuating around the steady state weights, uh, again, um, with uh, these this, uh, stochastic processes here, uh, the delta and the, and the lambda. So there is home bias in equilibrium and there is some portfolio adjustment, portfolio fluctuations around the steady states. So now can we characterize better uh, these, um, these portfolio adjustments? Well, so the first thing uh, that we can note is that if we were in a fully elastic currency supply world, so in other words, if the, uh, uh, it's a bit like the uncovered interest parity uh, world that Matteo was describing in his introduction, if we were in a world in which uh, uh, the forex supplier 
uh, could uh, supply uh, rec recurrency in an infinitely elastic way, then uh, the exchange rate volatility would disappear. So ET, the exchange rate, would always be equal to its equilibrium, which is one here for symmetry. Uh, and the uh, price of the equities will always, would always be their fundamental value price, uh, which would be a kind of autarky price. There would be perfect uh, global risk sharing. So each uh, investor would have 50% domestic equity, 50% foreign equity, would be a completely symmetric equilibrium with complete risk sharing and no exchange rate movement. So that would be an extreme case. Um, but in general, if the uh, guarantee supply is not fully elastic, then we are going to see portfolio rebalancing. So here, what is, what is happening, what we can show is that if we have an excess return on the foreign part of the portfolio compared to a domestic part of the portfolio, that means that uh, me as the domestic equity investor who is investing abroad, I've, I suddenly see my uh, uh, foreign share of my portfolio uh, being overvalued compared to my optimal weights, and that exposes me more to exchange rate risk. So since I'm more exposed to exchange rate risk, I'm going to repatriate uh, some of my capital out of foreign assets into domestic assets. So I'm going to rebalance out of foreign assets into domestic assets in order to decrease my exposure uh, to, foreign, uh, to foreign risk, to foreign exchange rate risk, which I cannot hedge. So what we can show in this model is that there is a negative correlation between excess return on the foreign share of my portfolio uh, and uh, my investment abroad. So in other words, if uh, the return on the foreign share of my portfolio goes up compared to my domestic share, I'm going to be repatriating capital. That shows up in a negative covariance between DT uh, DHF here, which is how much a domestic investor invests abroad, and the excess return on the foreign share of a portfolio compared to the domestic share of a portfolio. So the, the model predicts rebalancing, that is repatriation, when uh, the excess return abroad exists, ex when the excess return abroad is bigger uh, than the excess return at home. Another thing that uh, very, in a very logical and intuitive way that the model predicts is that if the foreign exchange risk is larger, that is to say, if the volatility of, a for of the exchange rate is higher, then the intensity of rebalancing will be higher. So this coefficient, this rebalancing coefficient, which I just um, uh, showed you, be the covariance between DHF and the excess return, is going to be uh, larger in absolute value if the volatility of a foreign exchange uh, is actually bigger. So this coefficient of rebalancing beta, which is negative, is going to be larger whenever exchange rate risk is larger. Okay, so these are highly testable implications, of course. And this is what we are going to do. So we are going to test uh, these, um, these implications uh, using some very disaggregated data on international equity fund positions at the stock level, the fact set data sets. So we'll have more than 28 million holdings uh, positions. And we have uh, this uh, data at the quarterly frequency. We are going to look to have sufficiently large sample at funds located in four countries, US, Canada, the UK, and, and the Euro area. So I don't have time to, to get into the summary statistics. What we are going to first test in this rebalancing behavior. Do these international equity funds rebalance their portfolio when the excess return abroad uh, is higher uh, than the excess return at home? And so that's what we are uh, going to look at here. So in order to do that, we have to construct a rebalancing, a rebalancing measure. So we construct first a passive weight, uh, which would be the weight uh, of a certain asset in a portfolio uh, if uh, the fund manager is not doing any active rebalancing just due to valuation changes. That would be the passive weight. And then we'll define the active change uh, in weight as the actual weight minus that passive weight. Okay, so that's going to be our rebalancing measure, delta H here which is the, the active minus the passive weight. And the test for rebalancing at the fund level is therefore going to be whether this covariance between this rebalancing and the excess return is negative or not. So that's going to be uh, what we look at. 
We are going to test that by running the regressions of uh, rebalancing on the excess return of a foreign share of a portfolio minus the domestic share, controlling for a time uh, domicile fund fixed effects plus fi fund fixed effects here. Uh, and uh, we are going to also allow for asymmetries. Is it the same if the excess return is positive or if the excess return is negative? So we will be allow for asymmetries as well. What do we find? So first of all, uh, we are going to find that there is strong evidence for rebalancing in the sense that all these coefficients here uh, are negative and strongly significant. This is going to be true uh, if we allow for lags, uh, which, we, uh, which we do uh, in, colon, uh, in colon three and, and, and two, three and four. Uh, this is, um, uh, what is maybe interesting is that if we allow for these asymmetries in terms of excess return being positive or negative, so this is going to be colon three, we don't find uh, evidence of asymmetry in rebalancing behavior. Uh, so there's no evidence there. If we split the sample before 2008 and after 2008, similarly, we don't find really any difference um, in the rebalancing behavior before and after the crisis. So strong evidence for uh, rebalancing is the first set of results that we have. The second set of results is about testing this interaction between exchange rate risk and, and intensity of rebalancing. So we interact the rebalancing coefficient with uh, foreign exchange risk. And so the coefficient of, uh, of interest here is the delta L, which is uh, the interaction coefficient uh, with the same uh, we have some same sets of, of, of controls as before. And what we find here, if you could focus on uh, the relevant columns are mostly the three and, and four here. Uh, what we find is that there is indeed uh, evidence of stronger rebalancing behavior uh, when uh, the volatility of a foreign exchange market is higher. So that's uh, what we find. So interaction between volatility and strength of rebalancing. Right, so now this is what uh, the theory was telling us, but of course, uh, having these uh, very rich data sets with a lot of uh, international uh, asset positions in it, uh, we are keen to explore if there is uh, some heterogeneity. So what we do is that we are gonna do that by uh, running some quantile regression to explore whether the rebalancing intensity could vary with some characteristics of a fund. So we now, uh, write rebalancing regressions um, with uh, different quantile of the rebalancing variables. So what we, uh, what we get in terms of uh, uh, results here is that uh, first of all, you have to look at where the zero is here, the zero is up there. So that means that all the coefficient, the rebalancing coefficient that we get are negative. So there is overwhelming evidence of rebalancing at all quantiles. But we do see that the rebalancing behavior is stronger at the extreme quantiles. Okay, so uh, strong, there's, in other words, there is stronger rebalancing at the tails of the rebalancing variables. Everybody is rebalancing, but rebalancing is stronger at the tails. This is true uh, at lag zero, this is true at, at lag one. So we are now going to, um, uh, to explore a little bit who are these funds who are associated with stronger rebalancing intensity. So at the tail. And who are they? Well, we explore three dimensions of heterogeneity. One is fund size. The other one is uh, home bias. And the third one is fund concentration. We see that the funds which are associated with stronger rebalancing behavior are actually the small funds. As you can see from the histogram of size of funds here, the funds which are at the, uh, associated with a stronger rebalancing are the ones which are small. Okay, so smaller funds show stronger rebalancing, possibly because of transaction cost. On the other hand, we don't find really heterogeneity in terms of home bias. Um, so that's, uh, that doesn't seem to be, uh, to be uh, changing anything. But we do find that the funds that are more concentrated tend to be associated with stronger rebalancing behavior. So two characteristics of the funds seems to be uh, associated with stronger rebalancing, small funds and more concentrated firm, funds. Right, so that's what we get out of that. Finally, the last thing that uh, our, our model 
um, of course, tell us is that rebalancing flows have an effect on the exchange rate. I mean, mind you, in our model, there's an equilibrium. So uh, it is the case that the exchange rate movements affect optimal investment, but conversely, uh, rebalancing flows also have an effect on the exchange rate. So what we uh, are doing next is that we are going to test uh, the effect of uh, rebalancing flows on, on the exchange rate. So one, uh, of course, easy thing that we can look at is simply a, a regression of the exchange rate change on uh, rebalancing behavior, on aggregate rebalancing flows, which we can construct by aggregating up from our microeconomic data. But this would really just be an equilibrium relation, so a correlation. And uh, ideally, what we want to identify is a causal effect of flows on, uh, on exchange rate movements. So we do run this wireless regression just uh, as a, a description of the data, uh, and, uh, and, and we find a significant uh, coefficient. But what we really want to do is to, uh, to find a way of establishing causality of flows uh, on, uh, on exchange rate. So in order to, uh, to do that, we're going to borrow from the recent work of uh, Xavier Gebex and Ralph Cohesion uh, their idea of a granular instrumental variable, uh, which is uh, intuitively very simple. It's about computing the difference uh, between size-weighted rebalancing and equal-weighted rebalancing, hoping that by doing that, we are getting rid of uh, common components uh, that could be correlated with uh, uh, the foreign exchange uh, supply. And by doing so, we would just be uh, uh, having an instrument whose variation would come from the idiosyncratic shocks of uh, hitting the big funds. And these shocks would be orthogonal with uh, the currency supply shocks. So that's, uh, that is the uh, identification assumption underlying the granular instrumental variables of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Ralph and, uh, and, uh, and Xavier. Uh, so we are going to do that. And that's going to be, uh, so we are going to effectively construct the GIV by taking this uh, difference between size-weighted rebalancing and equal-weighted rebalancing of the different funds, and therefore uh, putting the spotlight on the idiosyncratic shocks of, uh, of the large funds shocks. Uh, but uh, we are also going to be a little bit more sophisticated in that we are going to be uh, purging uh, the data first uh, from the uh, heterogeneity across funds. So we are going to construct uh, the instrument on the residual of a rebalancing purge from the heterogeneity that we uh, know exist in the data in terms of uh, fund size, in, in terms of uh, uh, fund concentration. So we are going to control for all that, for heterogeneity at the fund level. And we are also going to be controlling for 10 principal components of, uh, of fund flows. So we are going to be controlling for quite a lot uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, aggregate components here. So when we do that, so we have uh, several versions of the GIV. Uh, and, and as I said, we have a naive GIV, but we also have a GIV controlling for quite a lot of, of common components. And we will uh, do a two-stage um, operation here. The first stage, we are going to regress uh, the rebalancing, the aggregate rebalancing flows on uh, the GIV. Okay? And uh, we'll see how strong the instrument is. And the second stage, we will regress the change in the exchange rate on the instrumented rebalancing flow. And here we will be able to get from this estimation uh, the elasticity of supply of uh, foreign exchange, which is uh, our, our little kappa here, which is one of the important parameters of our model. So we do that. And here's what we find. Uh, so first of all, whichever version of a GIV we use, naive one or much more sophisticated one, we find uh, a strong, uh, that, that this is a very strong instrument uh, here. And then using the instrumented flow, we are able to estimate uh, the elasticity of supply. And so here are our results here uh, for so highly significant and relatively stable. So uh, what does it mean in terms of magnitude? In magnitude, it means uh, our elasticity of supply of foreign exchange is relatively inelastic. It's not as inelastic as the macroelasticity that uh, uh, Ralph and Xavier estimate, for example, for the equity market. 
and uh, that fits well with the intuition that the foreign exchange volatility is not as high as the equity market volatility. And the elasticity that we find is uh, roughly of the same order of magnitude of elasticities that have been found uh, formally in the literature, in particular by, by Harald in, in other papers, actually in a paper that Matteo cited uh, in his literature review uh, at the beginning of the, of the session. So to conclude, because I think I am roughly at the end of my allo allocated time here, uh, so we have constructed uh, an equilibrium in which uh, I guess the novelty is to jointly determine equity prices, exchange rates, and, and uh, so flows, uh, optimal portfolio flows uh, together in a, in, a, in a setup where there is incomplete foreign exchange risk uh, uh, hedging. Uh, so where exchange rates risk matters for portfolio allocation. Um, we have shown that this uh, model has a number of predictions in terms of portfolio rebalancing and in terms of linking intensity of rebalancing with uh, foreign exchange risk. We have tested these implications in the data and find uh, strong support for them. We have also investigated the heterogeneity uh, of the data using quantile regressions and we found that smaller funds and less diversified funds have largest rebalancing propensities. Then what we did is that we uh, tested another implication of the model, which is that rebalancing flows have an effect on the exchange rate. In order to do that, we have constructed the GIV uh, instrumental variable strategy. And we have shown uh, that uh, uh, we can show effect of uh, rebalancing flows and exchange rate. And we find an elasticity of foreign exchange supply, which is roughly uh, such that about $7 billion flow are associated with a 1% appreciation in our estimate. So that's what we have done. And now I'm going to, uh, Great. I guess, Thanks. leave. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing I answer the question later, right? Yes. So what we'll do is uh, we're going to hand it over to Oleg for the discussion now. And then we're going to do, after that, a 10-minute Q&A session. And so uh, at that point in time, we'll take some of these questions from the Q&A and in the chats, anyone please post your question as well as we're gonna allow for actual live questions. So that's in 10 minutes though. So first Oleg, please uh, go ahead with your discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, yes, so uh, well, this is a, a very well-known, well-established paper in the literature already. So. Uh, uh, I, it, it's been on my reading list for a while, and uh, I really appreciate that the uh, uh, that the organizers actually put a deadline for me to actually read it carefully and in detail and try to sort out uh, everything what's going on. So um, yes, yeah, so it's it, it's been a pleasure to read it. I'm going to mention that it's it's an intense paper to read, um, and so it's also a paper that's pretty much advanced uh, in its life cycle. So the comments that I will give. I mean, they're mostly for discussion, I guess. I'm not sure to what extent they're gonna help the authors at this point, but maybe it will help uh, the future work on the topic. And I imagine there's gonna be a lot, a lot of work that in general on this topic and work that um, uh, emerges from this paper. Uh, so this is indeed, uh, as Matteo discussed in the introduction and as uh, Ellen pointed out, it's, 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 it's one of the papers that focuses on the interaction between portfolio choice and open economy and exchange rate determination. And these things are not very commonly uh, done in the literature. Typically we focus on interest rate determination and exchange rate. So think of UIP, CAP kind of uh, literature that's typical doing portfolio choice is much less usual. So the papers that come to mind that's probably uh, Pavlova and the Gabon from you know, 10 years ago, but more recently the work by uh, Moto and Ralph, but it's not done very often. And the reason it's a notoriously difficult problem, right? To do portfolio choice in the open economy, uh, let alone simultaneously with exchange rate determination, right? And so this paper indeed focuses on the portfolio choice of uh, mutual funds and how they rebalance their portfolio in response to shocks. But it also endogenizes the exchange rate at the same time. And this is sort of like a big, a big feat to do it. It's, it's, it's sort of like notoriously difficult problem. Um, it does it in partial equilibrium. So this really helps. Uh, doing it in general equilibrium would be kind of fascinating. I'll try to talk, uh, I'll talk a little more about how it could be potentially nested uh, in general equilibrium. So 
when you think about this problem, think of like a Lucas trees in international economy, but endogenizing the exchange rates. Well, Lucas trees are kind of like uh, difficult by themselves, uh, but you add exchange rate and sort of like your head spins how complicated that problem is likely going to is going to be. So the other thing I was going to say, so this paper is, I think it's motivated by empirical work. So in a way, theory plays a secondary role to empirics, that at least was my reading, that the goal was to write down theory that would inform the empirics, given the data that the authors have. And because of that, I feel it actually justifies making some strong assumptions, right, to get to the structural equations where really, uh, you know, the data plays the key role uh, in the analysis. So I'm going to talk really quickly about uh, the main insight. So my hope was, uh, is like, I'm going to read the paper, I'm going to kind of study how it works, and I will write a simplified version of, of the model to explain how it works. And then you realize it's actually quite difficult to write a simplified version, right? So things are actually, you know, quite involved. But the intuition is actually very straightforward. So it's, it's one of the cases where you can quite easily explain the intuition without the, uh, behind the results, but actually setting up the problem formally is, is, is quite difficult. And so the idea is that, uh, you know, there are a couple of ingredients. One of the key ingredients is um, that uh, foreign exchange is an elastically supplied. So if you need to get foreign currency, you actually cannot get it uh, without paying a premium for it. And if the whole market wants foreign exchange, right, there's going to be an equilibrium premium uh, for getting foreign exchange, right? So it's the inelastic supply that they will try to estimate ultimately in the paper. And so it, it, it's kind of actually interesting that the same thing gives rise to home bias and portfolios, right? So the fact that when you're investing into foreign portfolios, right, you need the exchange to get it and you run the exchange rate risk. So both you need to pay for that exchange to get the foreign portfolios and you run the exchange rate risk. Well, it endogenously creates home bias, both in levels so that the domestic mutual funds will invest less um, in, in, in foreign equity, but also in changes. And in changes, it's the rebalancing part, right? So if, um, if there is movements in the value of the foreign portfolio, there is an endogenous home bias and this change in the endogenous change in the home bias and response to that. It's kind of like a second order component of home bias, which is the rebalancing of the portfolios. And this is really uh, what they focus on. And so the result, the key result that they get is if you get capital gains on your foreign portfolio, if you get high return on your foreign portfolio, you actually become overly exposed uh, to, to foreign exchange rate risk and you want to shrink the share of foreign assets in your portfolio. That's the rebalancing. That's what they will you know, ultimately see in the data as well. So basically the domestic mutual funds and foreign mutual funds want to relocate, um, uh, relocate their positions towards actually home equity when relative returns on foreign equities are high. And so you get this outflow of money into the home, you know, basically capital market, which appreciates the home exchange rate. And that's sort of the intuition. And this effects are stronger when there is more background exchange rate volatility. So in periods of high volatility, the rebalancing is stronger. So exchange rate movements will be strong. Well, I guess they focus on uh, in empirics on rebalancing, right? That, uh, that basically high foreign uh, returns lead to rebalancing towards domestic portfolio and towards domestic exchange rate appreciation. This affects a stronger and the high volatility, right? And so this is, this is what they do in the data and, um, and they find uh, evidence of this. They can do actually more in the data than they do in the model because they can slice the data in different ways and kind of uh, study the heterogeneity than they see across mutual funds. Um, Helen actually had a chance to describe it. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that. So I wanted to kind of, you know, I, I saw Dorian Fitzgerald had a picture with the Lucas trees and it was beautiful and I tried to find it, but I couldn't. And so this is, this is really the best I could do. So think of like two islands, one, uh, you know, the home island and the foreign island and they have each a tree. It could be that the trees have both apples or one tree has apples, the other has oranges because the goods market is not quite specified. You actually don't know whether it's a one good or multiple good economy. So if you do general equilibrium, that would be the interesting thing. And then thinking about the real exchange rate and so on. But here, it actually really doesn't matter. What matters is that each tree has a dividend process. And this is the only source of kind of shocks, right? How many you know, apples and oranges you'd get in a year. And the prices of those trees are endogenously determined. But the point is that all this is in a foreign exchange. And so in order to buy that, you need foreign exchange. And so you have to go to intermediaries. And these intermediaries are not willing to uh, supply exchange rate without a premium. And basically this part is uh, what the paper shares in common when with, for example, majority GABEX with the intermediaries, you know, supplying 
uh, supply and exchange rate. And so the point is, is, you know, whenever you have shocks here and here, and it leads to rebalancing, you need to go back to this market. And this is what determines exchange rate, right? And so kind of, you can sort of see, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to oversee the structure of the model, but writing it down is actually, uh, is, is fairly complicated. And that's why I'm not showing you the equations really. Okay, so he, I'm, I'm going to go ahead with my comments. So the, the first of the comments is, you know, it, it's interesting that theoretical predictions are so intuitive, but it's so hard to get like, um, kind of like to touch them, like really, really nicely in the paper, like the closed form solutions are difficult to get and so on. So, I mean, you have closed form solutions. And for example, you have this very intuitive results that as foreign exchange rate market has more perfectly elastic supply of currencies, this just collapses back to the Lucas tree model with like half and half shares and you know no home bias and so on. So this seems super intuitive, but just seeing it in the formulas is so difficult. And so I wish there was like a way to illustrate, you know, that that you know, like that limiting case analytically. So you can see those portfolio shares, but it's it's just difficult. And I, I couldn't really see a you know an, an obvious way, but I felt that uh, this would have helped a lot because the model otherwise feels a little complicated, even though intuitive. A related thing is I didn't always get a sense of whether what you show are kind of quantitative possibilities or very robust results independently of what happens to the dividend, for example, process and so on, or you had to pick you know, a particular process for dividends to give you those results about rebalancing, right? Is it always the case that high returns on foreign uh, portfolios lead to rebalancing away from the foreign portfolio? That seems to be a quantitative possibility, but not necessarily the you know, general implication of it. And then the question is, can we study more the conditions uh, when it happens and you know you might need to correct me if i'm kind of clueless here but but that, that was my impression from reading the paper at the same time the model has very strong assumption i'll talk a little bit about the, them later but so i felt that maybe you know you may maybe given that the assumptions are already strong maybe you want to make them even further stronger so that you get more analytic characterization right so like once the assumptions are already strong uh maybe um uh, maybe it makes sense to push it forward, but I don't have great suggestions for you exactly how to do it. Um, um, yes. So the second set of comments is more about empirics. Um, so one thing I was kind of curious, can you do more to figure out what's the source of the high exchange uh, of high return on the foreign portfolio? Is this like the discount sort of news or dividend news, right? Because it's not obvious to me that the rebalance in response will be the same independently of what triggers the high return on, on the foreign portfolio. So is there a way to do a decomposition of those returns and kind of know what caused the high returns? And it, it, it quite well could be possible that if it's dividends, uh, you not necessarily need to rebalance away from it. But you know, if, it's, if, 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 if it's higher valuation uh, of the foreign tree now, maybe this is the reason that you become overly exposed to that risk. And so I, I thought it would be curious to look at it both empirically and theoretically, actually, if something could be said about that. Obviously, the model has a dividend process and uh, prices are determined by the dividend. There is really not, I, I don't think there is much room for the discount rates, but in the data, we know that discount rates drive a lot of the, of the returns. Um, yeah, so I, I, this is a quick question. I was kind of curious in the mapping, in the theory, the portfolio rebalancing is like the shares of the three. In the data, I imagine it's in the value terms, right? So I was wondering how do you do that mapping between in the model thinking about the, you know, in terms of the shares, in terms of kind of the real units of the three into the portfolio shares, which are like in dollar terms in the data, I imagine, right? And so uh, I, was, I, I was not quite clear how you do the correction for that mapping. Uh, well, the other thing is the sequence that you test on the data is that high foreign returns result in rebalancing and you empirically test that link. And then you test the link from rebalancing to exchange rate movements. So you separately, you test two links uh, uh, separately. But then the question is if we kind of do the whole thing, it means that high foreign returns result in home currency appreciation. And so I, it, it did not strike me immediately as the obvious consequence that you would expect that high stock market return abroad is the uh, source of domestic currency appreciation. I was wondering to what extent that link is kind of unconditionally true or it's only true conditional on a particular types of shocks. You have a little bit of a discussion of this, that there, are, you know, there could be effects through financial markets and through goods market, and then you would wonder which one dominates. 
but I didn't see how sort of the empirical work kind of got to, the, to that condition because the first stage was pretty, you know, pretty unconditional, right? And so then I was wondering, does it mean that, you know, financial effect always dominates, right? And then we do expect exchange rate depreciation if domestic market is doing well, you know, domestic stock market is doing well. Um, yeah, very quickly, two things I was going to mention here. So in order to interpret results structurally, that, that kappa elasticity, the elasticity of foreign exchange rate supply, you really need, I think, to have the universe of agents that demand currency. If it's not the universe of agents, and if these agents happen to be correlated with other types of agents that demand currency, for example, the bond traders, you know, the noise traders of various sorts in the market and so on, what you obtain is uh, it could be you know, an elasticity that has the correct sign, but I'm not sure that it has an unbiased value because you sort of have an omitted, omitted variable problem. And perhaps there is a reason to think that different agents, actors are correlated in the market. And so it's not enough to have an exogenous instrument. You actually have to, I think for the unbalanced elasticity, you need to have the universe of people that demand currency in a given time. And if they're correlated, uh, you would get a bias even even with the instrument. Obviously, correct me if, 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 if I'm wrong here. The, lastly, I was gonna think, I mean, uh, granular instrument variables is this fascinating new tool to use. Uh, I was kind of curious that the OLS estimate and the instrumental estimates are literally the same. I mean, they differ by like tiny magnitude. They quantitatively the same, statistically the same. So what I was wondering, is there a way to like see what this construction of instrumental variable is doing, right? And you're taking a weighted average and you subtract the unweighted average, right? But the question is maybe unweighted average is just a bunch of, no like maybe unweighted average does not really represent what happens at the aggregate at all. So like if you regress aggregate quantities on the instrument and on just the weighted thing, you literally get the same fit pretty much, right? Because you're kind of like subtracting a piece that's unweighted. Like when you work with the firm level data, which I know much better than the financial data, if you take unweighted average of firms, right, you just capture lots of noise, which is not informative about the aggregates oftentimes. And right, I was wondering, is there a way to kind of like, not just appeal to granular instrument variables, but provide some, uh, you know, degree of confidence that, you know, it deals with the endogeneity problem. I'm not sure how to do it, but like some slicing of the data that, you know, you really are not using the aggregate trends again when you construct the instrumental variable, but you're using the high order moments like it's implied to do. I mean, that, that, that would uh, make me much more comfortable. This last thing, I mean, I, I will take maybe a minute or two on this. Uh, my specialty is really just general. One just one minute, please. Okay. One minute. My specialty is general equilibrium modeling. And so, I mean, Matteo already discussed it it's in the introduction. What I was going to say, it's really interesting that this could be nested in general equilibrium. And so if, if, if you know, if somebody is in search of a, a PhD thesis, this could be a pretty good idea. And so the way I think about it, the goods market, and this is what we explained in detail with Dima in our paper. So the good market results in equations of this sort, where these are like net foreign asset accumulation. And this is essentially the exchange rate that leads depreciation leads to, uh, you know, trade surpluses, right? So this is just the intertemporal budget constraint together with goods market clearing. And so this would be something like a, you know, stand of asset demand equation. So essentially what you guys do, you kind of drop the goods market altogether. You kind of get rid of that and you replace a more conventional demand for assets where you have like excess returns divided by the variance of the position, you, you, you replace it with this kind of thing, right? And, and, and the two together would do pretty much similar job as this guy. And so I think it's possible to write it down in general equilibrium where you have you know, two dynamic equations that sort of give you when you do co-integration, they give you a static equation like this. So you have to make strong assumptions that you know, supply of foreign exchange is a function of level of exchange rate, not the change. Typically in financial markets, we think it's all about the changes like in the UIP equation, right? Because you buy today, sell tomorrow, you do it in levels, you motivate it that it's mean reverting. You, you really don't have to make any of these assumptions if you did it in general equilibrium. I actually think, I, I, I don't feel bad about these assumptions because I think doing a general equilibrium model will kind of give you reduced form equations that look similar, but that, that requires a bit of extra work. And I think uh, actually somebody could do it. What I was the most fascinated by is this actually point is that you completely can, so typically the way we think about financial market is that there is the fundamental macro stuff like net foreign asset positions run by the country to buy and sell goods. Then there are noise traders and then there are intermediaries. The amazing thing, well, you get rid of the goods market side, 
But the amazing thing that you can completely get rid of noise traders. And so I was kind of fascinated that one can write down a theory of exchange rate without appealing at all to noise traders. And this is fully replaced by endogenous portfolio rebalancing. And so I was, you know, I was the most intrigued whether how far one can push, you know, general equilibrium model without appealing to noise traders and doing everything through portfolio rebalancing. Well, this, this requires a much longer discussion, but I think this is sort of like, this was the fun part for me. And I think it would be really fun to try to do it in general equilibrium. And so here's like another paper to be written, I think. Uh, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Oleg, for a great uh, discussion. Um, so uh, we are kind of running late. I'm gonna um, take one question live from the chat and then I'm gonna give you a chance to, to respond to both that and the discussion then. Uh, so if you could get Alessandro Rabucci uh, from Johns Hopkins. Hi, Alessandro speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, great paper and presentation and the discussion. Uh, I'm going to ask a question to um, Helen that I asked before, but I understand it a little bit better now. What are the implications of the analysis and the setup for the global financial cycle? It seems to me now that I better understand the paper that if we take a uh, uh, a view, a US centric view where we put the US at the center and then there is the rest of the world, uh, the implication could be at least partially be fully consistent. I wonder whether though that view is, uh, is the right one for equity trading where perhaps there is more bilateral trading uh, going on all the time. And I agree with Oleg that uh, uh, the granular IV is perhaps less of a silver bullet in that asymptotically when you have uh, uh, a large cross section, the weighting should not matter. So the fact that it matters, it may be picking up some 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 noise and some 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 small uh, small sample bias here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ellen. You can respond to that, and also if you want to respond to the discussion. Yeah, for well, thank you very much. First of all, to Oleg, as usual, <laughs> given a great discussion. Um, so I just want to make a few points. So first of all, Oleg, we, do, we did try to simplify as much as we could the, the model, uh, but very interestingly, you know, uh, in order to simply do that, do an optimal portfolio with a joint determination of exchange rate, we pretty much went bare bone and, and that's where we ended up. So it was very hard to do anything uh, more simple. So it's, it's kind of um, amazing that in a way, throwing in so many, you know, simplifications and uh, you know, bare bone model, you still end up with something quite complicated. And, and, and I do think it's because you have this two way interaction between the portfolio choice and the exchange rate determination. And, and whatever you do, if you're gonna keep that, it, it, it's, gonna be pretty, it's gonna be pretty difficult, I think. So unfortunately, um, we, we did try. <laughs> Um, I, I think it would be super interesting to, to, to uh, but, but I'm, uh, for, for another paper to do what you say about decomposing the, uh, the uh, excess returns into uh, different components, so shock on discount rate, et cetera, but th that would be a whole empirical project. I mean, we did look uh, in the past with Harald actually at link between excess equity return and exchange rate movement. And unconditionally, we did find something uh, that we kind of called at the time the uncovered equity parity condition, because there was this kind of co-movements between the uh, differential inequity return and, and the exchange rate. Uh, that was an unconditional uh, relation. And so I think it would be uh, indeed uh, interesting to, to explore this further, but that's, that's, uh, that's a big research thing to, to, to do that properly. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm probably not gonna do that in, in that paper. Uh, it's a, an important point about uh, the elasticity. So the elasticity indeed here is linked only to this uh, rebalancing flow. And so indeed, they are not all the flows. Uh, they are only part of the flows, uh, first of all, in the equity space. Uh, but also, uh, there could be other flows conceivably on uh, coming from bonds flows. I mean, as you, as you mentioned, and, and they could be correlated or not. I mean, the thing is, it seems, uh, it, it seems like uh, from an international investment point of view, uh, equity investments are not hedged usually for exchange rate risk, while uh, bond, uh, bond investments are, are hedged. So this has implication for, uh, uh, for exchange rate determination. I mean, if, if, it is, if the world is as simple as that, bonds flows are hedged, but equity flows are not hedged, then uh, this interaction with the exchange rate comes purely from the equity side and not from the bond side. Uh, now in practice, we could have, you know, some time variation in the hedging behavior, et cetera, and that's gonna interact. Uh, and, and there's some, uh, 
some nice recent paper uh, on interaction between exchange rate and hedging recently in the literature. Um, but uh, so we, this is something we are we are not exploring. So here we are kind of uh, relying on the fact that equity flows are somehow more important for exchange rate than, than bond flows because of this asymmetry in hedging. Uh, then we still have the issue of how much of the flows are we, are we capturing on the equity side. And uh, so compared to the CPIS data in the recent years, we are, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite a bit of coverage, but it's not full coverage. So then are the other flows fully correlated or not? I mean, that certainly would affect this, uh, this number, uh, uh, this, uh, how much of the flow you need to move the exchange rate by 1% would be affected by, by this. So that, that's definitely something that, uh, that is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, valid as a, uh, as a comment. Okay. Um, and just yeah. One minute. Just oh, one minute. minute. Okay. Yeah. So on the granular instrument, uh, uh, yes, so Alessandro, it could be that indeed we have a big cross section, and so uh, that's uh, uh, that, that could make our estimates more similar. I mean, uh, we and and also Oleg had, had uh, comments on that. I mean, we we are trying to really refine the uh, basic naive. Uh, uh, granular instrument estimates by really controlling for a lot of things. So first of all, purging from the heterogeneity of fund characteristics, and so constructing the GIV on the residual. And second of all, by uh, controlling for all these principal components uh, of the uh, balancing uh, flow uh, matrix uh, in our regressions. So uh, we are we are being as you know as exhaustive as we can there. Uh, and th there are a few differences uh, between the various estimates, but it's true that the differences are not that large. I mean, uh, that's one on the one, and so on the one, that means it's pretty stable, this, uh, this elasticity estimate there. Uh, and uh, uh, Alessandro, so I'm not sure. So the thing is, for the global financial cycle, you do want to introduce some asymmetry, presumably, in, uh, in your world economy. And so here we are dealing with an asymmetric world. So. I, with a completely symmetric world. So I would say the, the thing I see which could be relevant for uh, global financial cycle style literature is that you have these uh, joint uh, movements in, uh, in equity returns and, and, and exchange rates here, which come very naturally from the uh, endogenous portfolio uh, determination. Uh, and so this is something that we seem to see in these, in all these co-movements of the global financial cycle literature, but, uh, you know, to apply it more to the US, et cetera, I think we, we would want to have a more asymmetric model, which we, we don't have here. So that's again for future work. All right. Thank you, thank you very much.